It's always the moment of truth. <laughs> broadcast it, and then this is always lovely. Why, why does it say broadcast it? And then, okay, let's just. I think it's live. Uh, I don't know if you're checking on your end, Colton, but I think we are actually live on LinkedIn, even though it's giving me an error message. But I, I've grown accustomed to that, so that <laughs> I think is kind of normal these days. Um, yeah, it's live. I see it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, all righty. So everything is set up. We are live on the stream. Um, so welcome everyone to today's class. We're starting a little early for the stream announcement anyways, but that's all good because, again, the recording will be available for everyone. So, um, welcome to today's class. Um, keep it open. Oh, turn off, yeah, please turn off the lights if, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just so we have a little bit of a better, a uh, little bit of a better, oh yeah, it's like theater ambience now, perfect. Um, okay, <laughs> so thanks everyone. Uh, for coming to today's guest lecture. I am actually quite excited. Um, as you know, I have uh, posted an announcement earlier today about the uh, guest lecture uh, that we have. Uh, so we have with us today Colton Schweitzer, who will give an introduction to information architecture. Uh, now, as Colton has written, he got into UX by accident by creating a board game. That's very intriguing for me because I'm a big board game fan, of course. And uh, he went to a boot camp in 2015 and uh, was just struggling with different um, job offers for boot camp students about UX. And then he added his board game to his portfolio that landed him a job in Enterprise UX. So this is an interesting way to get into Enterprise UX via uh, creation of a board game. And uh, he noticed that a lot of the candidates were consistently overlooked during the hiring process. So him and his colleague, Ludovic Delmas, started the, um, I don't know if I want to call it agency, uh, kick -Ass UX uh, or company kick -Ass UX, uh, with the goal of reimagining UX education to fix the problems that the students were experiencing from um, university programs and boot camps. And now we're going full circle because we're bringing him back to the university um, <laughs> where we're actually trying to integrate uh, some of the knowledge that he has gathered out there in the free world. Uh, so I'm very excited for him to join us today uh, with this program. And uh, so thank you very much, Colton, for joining us. And I will now mute myself and let you take over. Thank you awesome. so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Leonard. I so appreciate being here. I'm stoked uh, to be talking with you all today. Um, and yeah, I would, instead of a, a um, well, I, I call us a, a UX education uh, company is like really what we're at and what we're after. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, humans today have the shortest attention span in the history of the world. The amount of stimuli that we're confronted with has grown so much that building simple user experiences has become more crucial than ever before. People don't have patience for bad UX. This means that we as UX designers have to be able to simplify information down to the essentials. That's where information architecture comes in. So today, we're going to go over the broad strokes of information architecture, otherwise known as IA, the difference between IA and UX, the four components of IA, then we're going to get more tactical and talk about how you apply IA in your designs, AKA layout. We'll cover what layout is and why it's important. We'll talk about the concept of visual weight, and we're going to talk about crap, but seriously, we are. It's uh, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. So let's start with an overview of IA. Information architecture is the organization and structure of content and information. The goal of IA is to help people understand what they see, find what they need, and complete tasks. To put it more simply, information architecture is all about taking a bunch of information and organizing it in a way that makes sense to the people looking for that specific information. For example, the way you organize information related to an auto mechanics website will be vastly different than the information on Nike's website. It sounds obvious, but it's true. Basically, Information architecture connects people to the content they're looking for. You might be telling yourself, 
information, IA is just organizing information. That sounds simple, right? And on the surface, you would be right, but it's definitely not as simple as it might sound. There are basically infinite ways to organize information. You have to understand the context, the user, their mental models, their goals, and the content you're providing them. This is why there are people who devote their entire professions to just being information architects. Information architecture creates order from chaos. IA is about building systems and structures to organize complex sets of data so, data so people can find what they're looking for. Here's an example of information architecture in the real world. Almost all grocery stores are, are organized in the same way, regardless of the store brand or where the store is located. This is because they use the same information principles and layout. That way, regardless of what store you're in, you feel comfortable and generally know where to find things. For example, you know you can find milk in the dairy section, which is usually located at the back of the store. Just like you also know that ketchup is located in the condiment aisle. Could you imagine a store that organized everything alphabetically? Ketchup would be located next to Kellogg's cereal, ham would be next to hammers, it just wouldn't make sense. So at this point, you may be wondering, isn't information architecture the same thing as UX? And the quick and dirty answer to that is no, they're not the same thing. Let's dig into that a bit by talking about the difference between IA and UX. At Kick-Ass UX, this is how we define UX. It's the process of making a product or service useful, relevant, and meaningful for people. By comparison, IA is the organization and structure of content and information with the goal of helping people understand what they see, find what they need, and complete tasks. When you see those two definitions side by side, you can see that IA is just one of the pieces that make up UX. After all, how could you make a product useful, relevant, and meaningful if no one could make sense of what they were seeing or find what they needed? As a UX generalist, you also need to be a competent information architect. You are in charge of organizing information on screen in a way that is useful, findable, and helps users complete tasks in the simplest way possible. So now that you have a basic understanding of information architecture, let's talk about the four main components of IA, labeling, organization, navigation, and search. As an easy way to remember it, don't forget to mow your lawns. At a high level, you can see why these are the four components, right? Since IA is the organization and structure of content and information, you'd first need to know what you call things, AKA labeling. Then you need to know how to group it all and make sense of everything, AKA organization. Then you need to create a system to find those groups and pieces of information. That's your navigation. And finally, a way to quickly get to a specific piece of information, search. First, let's talk about labeling systems or how you represent information. Labels and titles help people figure out whether or not the page, content, link, button, etc., will have the information they're looking for. Using the grocery store example, products like deodorant, shampoo, and hand soap can be found under the, under the label of personal hygiene. Just like Blu-ray discs, TVs, and gaming consoles can be found under the label of electronics. As a grocery store shopper, you don't expect to find Jello in the frozen food aisle. That's because the label doesn't match up with how the product has been categorized. People quickly scan labels before reading anything else to figure out if they're in the right place and if it's worth their time. It's best to choose labels that are universally understood and familiar to users. Make sure these labels reflect the user's perspective and not your own. Do your best to avoid using unfamiliar words or words just to make your content seem more interesting. Avoid jargon, use what is familiar. Next, there's organization. With organization, there are two different parts to this. There's schemes and structures. Let's start with schemes. And no, I'm not talking about pyramid schemes or the idiotic schemes of Wile E. Coyote trying to kill the Roadrunner. No, I'm talking about how you categorize content and how to establish relationships between pieces of information. Before we go further, there's a fundamental term to understand when it comes to organization schemes, and that's taxonomy. Taxonomy is the classification and grouping of information within a shared information environment. Put more simply, taxonomy is how you name and group similar things into categories. It's how you know that an orange is different than an apple and that a gala apple is a different type of apple than a Fuji apple, even though they might look similar. Let's take a step back and look at taxonomy as one of the pieces that make up IA. If information architecture is the housing blueprint, 
then taxonomy is the plan for each individual room. The kitchen would only contain items that belong in the kitchen. Each bedroom would only have stuff that belongs in the bedrooms and so on. It's the grouping of things within the same environment. There are many ways to create a cohesive taxonomy. Doing so requires you to understand the needs of your users, the context they're in, and the content you're providing them. What users are looking for needs to make sense in the context of where they're looking for it. Makes sense, right? Now that we've provided a basic understanding of taxonomy, you can use that information to determine what scheme to use in your design. A scheme is the method by which you choose to categorize your content. There are exact schemes like alphabetical, organized by alphabet. Think about the contact list in your mobile phone. Chronological, organized by date, think calendars. Geographical, organized by location, think Google Maps or Airbnb. And there are subjective schemes like topic, which are organized based on the subject of the content. Task, organized by determining, determining the actions and needs of the users when it comes to that content. Audience, organized for the different types of people who will be accessing it. And metaphor, content organized by relating familiar concepts such as folders, applications, and trash like you see in all computers. In general, pick the scheme that matches the content and mental models of the users accessing that information. For example, Airbnb wouldn't want to organize places to stay alphabetically or chronologically because people wouldn't be able to find the right place to stay. Instead, they organize their stays geographically and by specific categories like cabins, beachfront, or tree houses. Great, we have now covered the first half of organization. Now on to the second half, structures. Organizational structures establish how pieces of information are related to one another. A good structure allows users to easily find the content they're looking for on a site. There are three main organizational structures, hierarchical, sequential, and matrix. Let's first tackle hierarchical structures. These are also known as tree structures because there is a parent-child relationship between the pieces of information. They start with the larger category, parent, and then narrow down into more detailed pieces of content, children. Most websites and apps are organized using a hierarchical tree-like structure. For example, Apple's website is organized hierarchically. It starts off with all of their main product lines listed at the top. If you click on any of them, you'll see all of the submodels related to that category. Next, there are sequential structures where you go step-by-step step until you reach an outcome. Think of when you set up your smartphone. You had to go through a setup wizard that asked you a bunch of questions in a specific order before you could actually start using your phone. And finally, you have matrix structures. This allows users to quickly figure out their own path since content is linked in many different ways. Think Wikipedia. You can find something by searching for it, by reading about it in another article, or a multitude of other ways. The structure of a website is incredibly important. It has long-term implications of how things will be organized, especially as new features come out. If you're designing something from scratch, you need to make sure that the structure you choose allows for additions in the future. So quick recap on schemes and structures. Schemes are how you categorize information, AKA alphabetical, geographical, metaphorical, etc., And structures are how pieces of information are related to one another. For any given project, you almost always start with the scheme and then you choose the structure depending on the user's mental models. So at this point, we've covered the low and lawns. Let's move, out, let's move on to the NS. So next up is navigation. Navigation is all about how people move through and find content. When considering navigation, ask yourself, how do people move throughout your product to find the information they're looking for? There are many types of navigation, including global and local navigation, menus, breadcrumbs, filters, links, and so on. These elements help your users find the information they're looking for. For example, let's take a look at Google Docs. On the left, you'll see, you'll see their global navigation where you can head over to other Google products like Google Sheets, Slides, and Forms. You can also navigate to the Google Docs home, settings, help and feedback, and to your full drive account. Also, the rightmost arrow is pointing to another global navigation menu where you can go to other Google products, including Gmail and even admin functions. Last, within the middle section, you can navigate to local and individual docs. So finally, we have search. This is exactly what it sounds like. It gives your users the ability to find specific information they need. For example, let's look at Google Docs again. There's always an option to quickly find a specific document. 
But there's one quick caveat on search. Search is really only helpful if a website has enough content. If there is a ton of information, then search can help narrow, down, narrow things down. It just needs to be displayed in such a way that's useful and not overwhelming. Okay, at this point, we've actually covered information architecture at a high level. So now let's get more tactical and talk through how you apply information architecture within your design, AKA layout. So let's start, let's first talk by, <laughs> if I can speak today, let's talk about what layout is and why it's important. At the most basic level, layout is the structure and relationship between items on a page. For digital products, layout is about figuring out the arrangement of images, text, and overall functionality. Let's look at it like a food recipe. If UI elements, such as buttons, text, images, icons, etc., are the recipe ingredients, then layout provides the instructions for where and how you use those ingredients to make the overall recipe look and taste just right. For example, let's imagine we are designing a travel site. We are creating cards to display beautiful places that people could travel to. When designing the layout of a card, we would have a few ingredients, a beautiful picture, a title, some body text, and a rectangle. The layout would be the directions of where we place these ingredients to create a cohesive, visually pleasing card. Good layout can be learned. It's part science and part art, just like a good recipe. As an aside, if we were really working on this travel site, how do you think the information would be organized when searching for trips? At a high level, it would be geographically, right? In this example, you'll see that the overall categor categorization, AKA scheme is geographical. And within that section, it's organized alphabetically. Layout is important because it's quite literally how the information is organized and displayed on a page. Intentional placement of content helps users easily scan the page and find what they need. Bad layout results in mental friction for your users. Good layout helps people to understand what they're seeing and find what they need. It has a solid sense of hierarchy and visual relationships. Can you now see how layout is basically the implementation of information architecture in the real world? So now that we have a general understanding of layout and why it's important, let's now talk about the concept of visual weight. When you think about an object's weight in the real world, this concept isn't too hard to grasp. Stephen Bradley described it well in his article, 19 factors that impact compositional balance, when he said, visual weight is the perceived weight of a visual element. It's a measure of how much anything on the page attracts the eye of your viewer. Here are the six factors that contribute to the perceived visual weight of an element on a page. Let's break each of them down. First is size. Elements that are larger appear to be heavier than those that are smaller. Looking at the two squares, which of them attracts your eye more? The bigger one, right? That's because it is perceived as being heavier than the other object. Second is space. Elements separated by space are perceived as heavier than those that are closer to the other elements. For example, Everything is exactly the same between both sets of text, except the vertical distance between the header and the body text on the right is double that of the example on the left. Because of the space, the second header has more visual weight. Third is color. There are two parts to color. First, elements with intense saturated colors appear to be heavier than those with more muted colors. Looking at these equal size squares, the bolder red square on the right draws our attention more because its saturated color gives it more visual weight. The second part of color is, with, is this. Objects with darker colors have more visual weight than those with lighter colors. For example, the circle on the left is a darker version of blue, so it draws our attention more than the lighter blue circle on the right. Fourth is dimension. Three-dimensional elements are perceived to be heavier than two-dimensional elements. For example, Looking at these two objects, the 3D cube has more perceived visual weight than the square on the right. This is because our minds can assign a make-believe weight to the 3D square, but it has no reference to assign a weight to the 2D object. Fifth is proximity. Elements in close proximity to one another in an area provide the perception of more visual weight in that area. For example, the four squares on the right draw our eyes slightly more than the four on the left because the space between elements is less. And last is location. An object's visual weight increases as it gets further away from the center of a composition. For example, if you look at the two canvases below, the green square on the right canvas draws our attention more because it's really far away from the center of the composition. It's important to understand the concept of visual weight because it's directly involved in how we lay out objects on a page. This directly translates to how people are able to navigate and find what they're looking for. 
So now that we've talked about visual weight, let's talk about crap. And no, again, we're not talking about bowel movements. Crap is a set of four design principles for layout created by Robin Patricia Williams. Contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Let's begin with contrast. Contrast is about using visual weight to make elements stand out and draw our attention. It's used to help move the audience's focus to the most important things they should see and understand. Usually, whatever element has the largest contrast is understood to be the most important thing on the screen. Contrast enables us to get faster understanding of hierarchy and to quickly see important pieces of information. Because it's 100% 100 related to visual weight, contrast can be created through color, shape, size, interaction, proximity, font choices, symmetry, and the list goes on. Color, color contrast in particular is incredibly important for accessibility. Let's look at an example of contrast in UI with MailChimp. Before we break it down, just take a moment and see what stands out to you. As a quick reminder, the reason that elements stand out is because of visual weight and contrast. So looking at this image, six things immediately stand out. First is the picture. Our eyes go there immediately because it's the biggest thing on screen, is off center, has a person in it, and has the most color. In short, this object has the most contrast and visual weight. Second is the headline. Our eyes then travel from the picture to the element most related to it to try and learn more about the picture. The headline is the second biggest element on the screen, creating contrast in its size. Third, the watch now button. The contrast through color and size and the proximity to the headline draw our eyes right to it. Fourth, the sign up free button in the top right. Because the button has the same color as the watch now button, the similarity in color and visual weight attracts our attention. Fifth, the text below the headline. And finally, the MailChimp logo. Of course, you may have looked at these elements in a different order, but you get the idea. Contrast helps to draw our attention and set of elements apart from one another. It helps focus our attention to what information matters most. Again, you probably can see why layout is basically the implementation of information architecture in design. When contrast is applied correctly, it's something you probably shouldn't, that probably shouldn't be noticed. So next up, there's repetition. Repetition is about unity and consistency. It helps people quickly understand what they're looking at because they can see all similar elements. Think about repetition this way. It's a lot easier to look at 24 objects that look the same than to look at 24 unique objects. Your brain has to parse each different object separately. Whereas with repetition, your brain can group all like objects together and quickly understand what's going on. For example, Every person on a soccer team wears the same jersey. This helps others quickly identify which team, which, which team each player is on. The differentiating elements are the numbers and the names on the player, of the players on the jersey. The numbers and the names of those players appear in the same place, so if you want to know this information, you know where to look. Could you imagine a sports team that had varying jersey colors or patterns? It would be really hard to tell who was on the same team. As repetition is all about consistency, it's super important to keep patterns, AKA colors, fonts, branding, and functionality consistent across your product. Let's look at Pitch's website to see how they use repetition. First, they're very intentional with their color choice and font. You'll see the same font styles and colors throughout every part of their website. Their main gradient is used on their primary buttons as well as their background for their product photos and their testimonials. Additionally, they use the same spacing and layout choices throughout the website. This makes it easier to navigate because you can quickly get a sense of what's going on. The navigation, actions, and elements look the same, so you're easily able to develop a mental model for their website. They also cleverly repeat the exact same collaborator, st collaborator style for their testimonials as they use in their product, helping your brain draw the connection between the way people collaborate in their app and how they see folks who are providing them with reviews. They also are very consistent with their 3D illustrations, even down to their signup form. Next up in crap is alignment. Alignment is about the organization of elements relative to a line or margin. A design with poor alignment is like walking into a room that's cluttered and hard to get around. It makes you uneasy and it can be frustrating to try and make sense of everything around you. Alignment is important for four reasons. One, it matches how people naturally scan and focus on content. Two, it's visually appealing. 
Three, it provides a sense of balance. And four, it creates a relationship between similarly aligned elements. There are two basic kinds of alignment, edge alignment and center alignment. With edge alignment, elements are aligned consistently to the left or right. With center alignment, elements are aligned consistently in the center. Using a grid to align elements can help you really create a sense of cohesion and establish a relationship between elements. This is especially helpful for, helpful for scannability. And finally in crap, there is proximity. This principle states that elements that are close together are seen as related. This closeness shows connectedness. This helps create perceived groupings and these groupings reduce cognitive load and increase readability. For example, on Google Flights, the type of trip, number of passengers, search fields, dates, and filters are all close together. This close proximity shows that they all work together. If you're familiar with the Gestalt principles, this should sound familiar because this is the exact same thing as the proximity as the proximity Gestalt, Gestalt principle. Ah, I'm having a tough time with English today. <laughs> Before finishing off this lesson, I just want to expand crap to include an H, B, and W. So it's Trapua, kind of a weird combination of crab, chap, raw, and crap. Hopefully that creature doesn't exist. Anyway, H is for hierarchy, and it's all about the correct ordering and visual treatment to allow users to easily scan and understand your content. Use hierarchy to establish relationships between parent and child content, create categories, and generally build a sense of order and organization. Proper use of hierarchy will help you make your designs easy to understand and help users figure out what matters most on a page. If you've been following along so far, then you should be able to see how this directly, directly relates to IA. Information architecture principles will help you create a sense of hierarchy and what information is apparent and what is a child. For example, Nike's navigation provides a clear sense of hierarchy through font spaces and styles. I'm sorry, through, through space and font styles. The top level categories of new and featured men, women, women, kids, sale, and back to school as tabs help to establish where you are and what you're looking at. The space between those options and the menu beneath provides extra visual weight to show their importance and to highlight the hierarchy of information. Then in the main section, they use larger labels and smaller text to show where each item belongs. Let's bring this full, full circle and come back to lawns. Labeling, organization, navigation, and search. Their labeling starts with high-level categories of new and featured, men, women, kids, sale, and back to school. From there, their labels describe the type of clothing, section it's in, and buyer intent. Now onto that organization. Their overall scheme they use to organize their navigation is based on the type of person shopping for that clothing or being shopped for. This is obvious, especially in e-commerce, and it's highly intentional. If you're a woman shopping for herself and her children, then you know to go to the women tab and kids tab. Then the scheme is by clothing item and buyer intention. The people who are looking to have a deal have a section dedicated to that, whereas people who don't care about that and just want a new pair of shoes have a, have a clear place to go. Also, the structure here is clearly hierarchical. You can see how each category within the page belongs to the overall women's tab and each subcategory belongs to the category above it. Next in Lawns is navigation. This menu literally holds all of their links to everywhere on their site, so we're covered. And finally, you notice their search in the top right, making it easy, easy to quickly find a specific item. Moving on from hierarchy, next there's the B, which is balance. This plays into the Gestalt principle of symmetry. When something is imbalanced, our brains want to fill in the gaps and find the missing pieces to make up different shapes that aren't there. Balance creates harmony, associations between content, and helps lessen cognitive load. Look at how Airbnb creates balance in their online experiences page. You can literally split the, split the page down the middle, and it's equal on both sides. This creates a really wonderful sense of harmony. Finally, there's W for white space. And no, this doesn't mean just using a bunch of white in your designs. White space refers to the negative space for the space between your content. I left white space for last because it's used in all the other principles for layout. Proper use of white space can help define and separate sections, establish relationships between different pieces of information, and it gives your content room to breathe. For example, look at Airbnb's old help center. I'm using the old one because our new help center isn't as good of an example. Anyway, they use a generous amount of white space to separate the header and each of the sections. 
It makes the page feel light and easy to consume, even though there's a lot of information. If the white space is removed, the page doesn't feel as easy to consume because it's cramped and harder to tell each section apart. It's also harder to figure out what to focus on and what to do next, AKA it has a bad sense of layout. Trapawa are another set of principles to consider when building the layout of a page. So let's recap everything we've gone over. Information architecture is the organization and structure of content and information. The goal of IA is to help people understand what they see, find what they need, and complete tasks. Information architecture connects people to the content they're looking for. IA is only a part of UX. It provides the bones, structure, and organization of information. The four components of IA are lawns, labeling, organization, schemes and structures, navigation, and search. Layout is the structure and relationship between items on a page. Layout is basically the implementation of IA principles in your designs. Intentional placement of content helps users easily scan the page and find what they need. Visual weight is a measure of how much anything on the page attracts the eye of your viewer. And finally, I covered the very strange creeper, creature, Trapoa. Contrast, repetition, contrast, hierarchy, repetition, alignment, balance, proximity, and white space. So that concludes uh, the lecture. Um, happy to answer any and all questions. Well, thank you so much. Let's give you a quote in the hand. That was amazing. Thank you so much uh, for uh, preparing all of that. So much, uh, so much really great content. Um, do we have any questions in the audience before I go to the questions that I've collected on Teams? Yeah? Did you, did you get that quote now? Do you want me to repeat it? If you can repeat it. Because... Yeah, so Angela's asking, how, how can we make sense out of the opposing relationship between space or white space and proximity? Saying that pro proximity is helping us align items close together, where space is telling us to keep the space and, and put them apart so that we can make sense of them. Like, what, what, how would you say to best make sense out of those opposing relationships that we have there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, really, I think the important thing to use for white space is separating separate content and sections. So if you think about a website by itself, like people can really only focus on one thing at a time for the most part. It's actually one of the biggest learnings that I've had in my career. I always thought, oh, I can multitask, people can multitask. No, people can't. Um, and so like providing a very clear section like uh, sections delineated by white space, and then the proximity of that white, like the proximity within that section is a lot closer. So for example, let's say I was creating a website and it was all about information architecture and I'm teaching this exact subject, and I was had a section for uh, lawns, right? Well, like the thing above that would be the, the previous category that I was talking about, like this kind of overview of IA. So that would be the headline up there and it would have content that was closer, and then there'd be a larger space between that top section and then the lawn section, and then that would be closer together. So the proximity shows the relationship between that section, and then the space in between shows that they're, they're separate. And hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully my gesticulating is, is making sense and translating on this call. Yeah. Uh, Angela, did you have a follow up to that? Uh, not a follow up, but another question is like when we're like, if I wanted to do website design, where do I start? In, um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a good one. I think Colton's probably getting that question a lot. If, if somebody wanted to start with website design, where do they start specifically when they want to start organizing information that somebody has given them? Like, how do they even get started in that sea of information? What's the first step somebody should take, I guess? That's a great question. So um, in general, it's going to be um, doing a lot of upfront research and discovery. So you're going to have to learn a lot about the space you're in. So like, I've never thought it's a bad thing to be brand new to um, an industry or a type of company because it gives you a fresh perspective for like how you can approach things that make sense to new people. 
but you're, the way that you organize needs to make sense to new people and to experienced people. So that's why it's gonna be important to come in with an open mind, do a huge content audit of like what they already have if they're giving you that information. Also, going through and researching everything you can online about that space, so beyond what they're giving you, like what can you go and learn uh, just about the general company, the industry, anything like that. And then what you really wanna do is look for mental, like well, look for similar patterns in similar places, like in, in similar companies, similar offerings, so you can kind of borrow mental models that are there. So that's like if you had no opportunity to talk to people. If you have an opportunity to talk to people, what you're gonna wanna do is everything I just talked about, and you go and validate those things with people. So you can do card sorting, like, but you'd have the categories kind of there. There's, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's two different types of card sorting. There's open card sorting and closed card sorting. Open card sorting is where you have a list of things that belong in certain categories and you allow them to create their own categories. So um, let's say for example, I had a bunch of apples uh, in you know my in my cards, then what I could do is have people go sort them into their own categories, and, and they might say like sweet, or these ones are sour, or you know whatever. These ones are red, and they would be the ones creating the categories. A closed uh, card sorting is where you provide the categories, and they have to sort that content into those categories. The benefit of open is you learn what people call categories and how they organize. Um, but this can be a little confusing to try and uh, bring all that information together because you can get a, a lot of different categories that might not make sense. And with closed, ca uh, closed card sorting, like you are providing the categories and so you're just seeing how people group that information to make sure that what you are thinking is what they are thinking and it matches their mental model. So um, that's one way of validating with people, but you also can just do usability testing or just show your designs to users and get their feedback and, and like ask them to do a task or just like what, ask what they think and, and see what they have to say. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe just hold it for one sec. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. I just wanna make sure to give other people the uh, opportunity to speak. Is there any other question in the room? Otherwise, I will go to some of the questions in the chat. Um, feel free to think about it um, or to just, and Angela, also feel free to just post it in Teams and I'll, I'll get back to that later. Um, okay, so one question that we had coming in here was uh, from Ben, uh, great intro. I wanted to ask what the differences are between IA and a sitemap. So, uh, SIA, uh, sorry, SIA, geez. I'm struggling with English today. Um, a sitemap is a tool for IA. Like, so a sitemap just helps you visualize how everything fits together. IA in general is how you organize that information. So it's kind of like how, um, you say like wireframing, sketching, and final visual design are all parts of the overall like design process. If you think about the IA, like creating IA as a process, sitemaps are one of the tools you can reach for to make make sense of the information that's there. That's really all it is. It's just how is everything organ like organized? How is it? How do how do pieces of content relate to one another within your site? That's really all it is. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think that was a great answer. Um, the next question we have here is how does one, this is a very specific one, so you, you're probably going to have to dig in your toolbox a little bit for this one, but how does one begin to design a breadcrumb on a website? Do we start with a card sword? What do we do with multiple entryways into particular pages? Uh, that's a great question. If there's multiple entryways, I think you have to pick one that's the primary way. So for example, um, I think like Wikipedia is a good example for this. Um, like, and I haven't been on Wikipedia for a little while, to be honest, but like if I were to design Wikipedia right now, I would have a primary category, like let's say a primary topic, and then there's a bunch of subtopics. And like, even though I could be coming from completely different space over here to this primary topic, like that other thing that'd be the breadcrumb, the subtopic would ladder up to that, the primary category. So you're gonna have to think through like, what are, what's the number one category that this thing belongs to? And that's where the breadcrumb would be. Um, so in general with breadcrumbs though, like I, I think you're, it's going to be a lot of research because, um, you need to understand the context that people are in, like what, what the context they have, they understand their goals. What are they trying to achieve? What are the problems they're facing? Um, just things about the, the space in general. And then from there, you'll be able to translate that into the breadcrumbs based on that research. And you could do the card sorting like we talked about if you really wanna go there. Um, but you really need to understand what belongs to what and, and how people think about it. 
Yeah, thank you. I think it's it's really important to be tactical there, right? Like uh, it's uh, it's definitely something that we probably see much more often in practice. Um, here's a quick question from Nathan, who is asking, "What's the relationship between IA and user flow? Uh, Difference, yeah. contrast, similarities? What situations may require either or both? Is one more important than the other? So IA and user flow. What are your thoughts on that?" Yeah, first of all, I'm looking at the questions too, so I'm kind of reading them as we go along. And okay. big shout out to Nathan. He's uh, been a guy who's been a part of our uh, community for a long time. He's awesome. Really, really cool guy. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so the relationship between IA and user flows. So user flows is just another tool. So user flows help you understand how a user gets through a certain task. So for example, um, let's say we're working on air, like we work for Airbnb and we're doing an air, like we're doing a user flow for how someone like, Buy, like buys a stay, you know, uh, reserves a stay. So we'd start with the very first screen they begin on with the user flow, like so they come to Airbnb. Um, and actually, pause real fast. There are two ways to do user flows. You can do user flows with just like sticky notes, where you write out each task that they have to accomplish to move on to the next thing and the decision points along the way. So basically, it's just like you can use Lucid charts or or um, or Fig Jam to to get there. It's basically just a uh, flow chart. Uh, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is you create what are also known as wire flows. I also just consider them to be user flows where you show the actual screens a user goes through, what thing they're clicking on and where that takes them. So you can basically see how a user progresses from the start of an, like an interaction to them accomplishing their goal. Like how do they get from point A to point Z depending on and like all the decision points along the way. So a user flow is just really a tool to be able to illustrate how someone does this. It's great for handing off the developers so they understand what's going on. It's great for explaining it to other people, um, especially because it's a static thing where like I would have a page that has these flows uh, versus a prototype, which forces someone to click through and they have to know where to click through to see how it works. Um, <clears throat> whereas IA is a general large category. It is how you organize information and content. And so user flows kind of belong within the IA uh, realm ish, but it especially belong within the designing realm. It's kind of like, like a hybrid tool to help you understand kind of how everything works together. All right, before I keep going with the, um, with the uh, online bit, is there any more in person questions? Did anyone? Have Angela? Did you remember your follow-up? Oh yeah, I was just wondering, like, can IA be also uh, used on like data rather than just visual media for like the like databases and things like that? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, so, Colton, can IA be used for uh, data, uh, specifically databases and other forms of data, other than just visual information? A lot of your examples were visual examples, of course, but. Um, what are your thoughts on structuring data with IA? Yeah, I mean, think about, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with Google Analytics or really any payment processing tool like Stripe where it's telling you all this information. Like it's, it's giving you data, like specific pieces of information, like numerical information, and that will ladder up to a certain category. And so it'll be like total sales, like total sales, that's a category. And then all this information, all this data ladders up to that. Like that's the one thing and there'll be like you know maybe it has a, br a breakdown between revenue and profit and so like it would have information related to that so that's just one example but yeah absolutely it applies to anything uh, information slash content based awesome thank you so much uh let's continue with uh, the online questions here um how would you organize items that create new categories and that do not fit into existing labels when you're looking at labeling, for example? How would you organize items that create completely new categories and cannot be fit into existing categories? Um, if they can't be fit into existing categories, then you, you need to create new ones and you need to find labels that make sense. So the, the thing that can be, Tricky about that is you might have a product that doesn't have very much space to create a new category. You have like limited horizontal space or limited vertical space. And so whatever the situation is, you have to be creative in a way that adds to that, where it doesn't, it allows it to be scalable, your design where you can add more things. Um, but like 
the long, well, I guess the short answer is you have to do more research to determine what that label should be. Like if, if you know that you have to create a new category that you can't put it in something else, then you have to do that. Like you have that information, so you gotta move forward with it. And then it's all about uh, like figuring out what the right label for those categories, whatever they are, so that the information fits and users know, oh, I'm looking for this thing, I'll click this category to get it. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yep, I think that was good. Um, then we have, I think this is a list of questions, but let's start with this one. Reza is asking, um, first of all, he's saying people like you are the reason he loves this field and that he thought your presentation was awesome. But how do the applications of information architecture principles vary across different digital platforms such as VR apps, mobile apps, and websites? Uh, when you're designing specifically for these, what are the unique challenges that each of these platforms present? Uh, I believe our understanding of information architecture in VR, for example, is still very limited. How should information architecture be adjusted for different cultural contexts? I think this is another question already. So let's, sure. let's just stick with VR first and, and these uh, VR and mobile contexts. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm reading, reading the question. So how do the applications of, uh, of information architecture principles vary across different platforms, such as VR, mobile apps, websites. So at the end of the day, information architecture should be applied basically the same way across each. It's how you display that information. That's what changes. So like, um, IA is just the organization of information. So if you have a website that is on a, you know, desktop, like you're still going to translate that to mobile and it's going to still be in the same categories. It's just going to be displayed a different way. So, for example, on uh, desktop, just like the IA, uh, like or like the architecture itself of your phone, we'll start on the desktop. Is at the top you have the URL, right? And like it's put at the top because it's like hierarchically speaking, that's where you're at. And if I type and I do something there, like I I change the website and it changes the content below it. Whereas on mobile, a lot of at least with Safari and some other ones, they now have the URL on the bottom because it's closest to your thumb. Right? It's the same exact information, it's just displayed in a different way. So it's not necessarily about the way, organ like IA again, coming back to the definition, is like the way that content, is or content and information is organized. It's all about organization and categorization. So that is always gonna be the same, uh, regardless of whatever platform you're on. It's how you then display that information. And so I'm not a VR expert by any means, but I remember listening to this a while ago, and that is when they, like I forget which company it was, but they had a game, and their menu was in the top right because that's a pretty typical place to find a menu. But what they found was is that people were moving their arms up to then get to their uh, menu was more of a pain in the ass. And so it actually made more sense to have certain actions that are more um, like common to be lower down because that's where their arms are. So if you were to put that exact same thing, the exact same game on your computer, you probably have a different layout to that. Like it, it, again, the, the information is organized overall the same way like, but the way it's displayed that's the the part that changes and this is where like <clears throat> information architecture are the principles of organization whereas layout is how you display that information it's like the actual implementation of information architecture on the whatever thing you're designing for whether that's desktop mobile vr so the layout ch layout principles change depending on which um platform you're designing for but ia principles do not change All right, awesome. Um, I think the, the second question was different cultural contexts and considering that people from different cultures may have different mental models and expectations. Um, and I know that this is obviously something that in visual design that's quite important. Colors mean different things in, in different cultural contexts, right? So uh, same with words, uh, choice of words, translation of words can be very different. A word that might mean nothing in North America might mean something very significant in uh, Asian cultures and other way around. So what do you think? Like, is there a way that information architecture can work across different cultural contexts? What should we be considering if we're trying to adjust for those different mental models? What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think it comes back down to kind of bucketing. <clears throat> so you're talking about different cultures, like the way that we in America are going to, well, you guys are in Canada, right? So, but like in America, where I'm at, like we're gonna have a different like belief system around many different things. And like you talked about certain Asian countries or European countries. And so like the country becomes the bucket, right? That becomes the bucket that then houses all of the information pr principles related to that. 
So that the categorization that relates to American beliefs versus Canadian beliefs, like that might mean that your IA, the structure of your IA changes depending on the, like the bucket of the people who are looking at it. And so like, as far as like translating a design to be universal, that's going to be tricky, like in general right? That's because like the way like we just talked about the way that someone perceives one thing over another is going to be different depending on your context. And so like, I think you design in general for the majority of people who come your way, the majority of your customers, majority of your viewers, whatever, that's who you're designing for. And if you need to have another, like a scenario, another uh, group of people that you're designing for, then that's a separate bucket. And you may need to consider different categorization for those folks. All right, uh, thank you so much. We have another one here that says, in UI layout design, what is the preferred way of using white space, dividers, cards, boxes, et cetera, to make information architecture visible on the screen, uh, now specifically for UI layout? Um, that's, I think, a more practical one, right? Yeah, definitely more practical. Um, so there isn't a straightforward answer to that because it depends on your brand guidelines, your styles, like your design system, all that stuff. Like, for example, many companies don't use divider lines to separate content. Some people do, some companies do. And so like, you will need to follow that practice. Like if it really depends on the feeling that you wanna have, like when people are, are using your uh, product, service, website, whatever. Um, like, for example, if you look at websites that have a ton of white space as in separate, sections like that have a lot of space between them um and like space between the content but it's clear what the sections are like that feels really light and airy overall compared to something that's more densely packed and so like there really isn't like i can't give a, a straightforward answer of preferred what i would say is if you want something to feel lighter which we probably all do we want it to feel usable generally use more space like that is the thing that people i think mess up the most is they put everything in such a small environment. Um, people scroll, <laughs> people definitely look down the page, they know to scroll now. So um, that's like expected behavior. Like I will always err on the side of having more space and allowing people to focus on one thing at a time versus far too many things. And so the perfect example of this are uh, web forms, right? So a web form, you can think of Google Forms, you can think of the Smartsheet, Airtable, uh, Typeform, uh, Survey Monkey, right? All those different places have forms that you can fill out. And Typeform did something that was different than everyone else, and then people started copying them. When they started putting up just one field to fill out at a time, it took up your entire screen, and they made it easy to use your keyboard to go to the next thing. It, but they obviously have, obviously have buttons to get down to the next thing too. But think about that. That's a ton of white space. It's like an entire page dedicated to one question and a bunch of space in between. But it, what it does is it makes it easy to focus on the one thing. So Again, there's not really a preferred way. You'll have to think through what works best for you and like the, the way that you organize information. And so like, like coming back around, he talks about cards, boxes, right, right? Like if cards make sense for what you're doing, then use them, like, but make sure that you use them in a consistent way across the entire thing, the entire project that you're using. So for example, like let's say that I have, I'm selling books, right? Maybe all of my books are in a card, but nothing else is in a card. So I don't make it confusing because like, something might not be clickable and it might not be a book. So I, I want to be as consistent as possible. So that's just like one th example, obviously we can go through more, but um, yeah, unfortunately there's not a one size fits all answer. It depends on the, the look and feel that you're going for. Um, but if I could make a recommendation to be use more space than not, like, uh, yeah. And use the eight point grid system. <laughs> yeah, I think that that was really good. That That's re really, the idea of, uh, first of all, sticking to the principles and then yeah, using the space where you can. Um, I think another one here, this is, again, everyone is really liking the presentation. So again, kudos to you, Colton, for doing that. A lot of people are very excited about Thank this. Um, is there a preferred tool? Uh, now I know this, uh, we don't want this to be a Figma versus UX discussion like you can sometimes see, but is there a preferred tool uh, for IA that you would recommend um, or that you think is really good? Like, like this is just tools? Yeah, just 
just any tool or? Yeah, well, for me, I mean, I at this point, Figma has taken over everything. I, I think that you can do 95% of what you need with Figma. And so I don't know why you'd go somewhere else. Like I was a dyed in the wool sketch guy. <laughs> so like I had to migrate over to Figma and it is night and day. Like they do an amazing job. So definitely use Figma. You don't need really anything else unless you need to validate your designs with complex prototyping. Uh, and that I recommend either Axure or Protopie. I have more experience with Axure, and so I, you know, I've had to use that to to create some pretty um, kind of crazy prototypes, um, just to validate that people could use something beforehand. Um, but yeah, I, I would say like if you are especially new to UX, like you don't need to do anything else. Just go to Figma, learn Figma, learn the keyboard shortcuts as much as you possibly can, learn auto layout, learn all the things that you can with it. Like because your ability to use that and use it quickly is gonna is especially uh, gonna be a determining factor for like keeping a job and moving forward. I, I, I even know that like I firmly believe in being tool agnostic, as in if you have to, you can move on to something else. Like. Figma at this point in time is the industry standard and is the by far the best tool in the market for what it does. Perfect. Yeah, I think there's one more that we have here. Uh, and I think that's a typical beginner question that you can usually find that I'm pretty sure some folks in the audience here are interested in as well. Um, how can I avoid that my design shouts out, I'm a beginner, I'm a, I'm a noob, I'm a junior designer. Um, is there any, are there any strategies that you can recommend uh, yeah. to make the design look a little bit more mature? And I'll talk about this from two perspectives. So one side of this that I hear all the time from portfolio, like when people are asking me to review their portfolio is like um, from the design side of things, like how their actual uh, UI design looks. And then it's also from the, process standpoint so like going through the process like what steps do they take to get from point a to point z so when it comes to the design side of things like most of the time and like i i mean this with all the love in my heart uh juniors who are coming into ux who haven't don't have a graphic design background don't have experience with that like most of the time your designs are based on your own taste and it's hard to know what's wrong when you haven't got the experience, but like it looks bad because you're not modeling what works and you don't understand the principles behind it. So layout, like we just talked about, like use those principles to actually create good layout, like Trapoa, what we just talked about. Um, also the Gestalt principles, like those are gonna be like guiding ideas to get your design into a good place. But like really all it comes down to is repetitions. Like it's kind of like going to the gym, like, you, you know, you. Don't expect to go to the gym for a week and to get jacked. Like it takes time and effort to get there and to build that muscle memory and, and to then, you know, build the muscle. The same thing applies to UX and especially to UI design. Like you have to put in the time to understand what works and what doesn't. So what I recommend to all junior designers, uh, people who want to get better at this, go to the top sites, go to apple.com, go to, go to Figma if you want to, doesn't really matter. Like pick your top favorite sites, go, go to applications, screenshot them and then recreate them in Figma. What's important when you do this though is understanding re resolution. So for example, like designing at one X, what that means is that it's, it's like 100% size, it's what you will see on the screen versus if I'm designing for mobile, if I'm designing for Android in particular, like I would design it 360 by 640 pixels because when I uh, when that gets exported, when that actually is rendered, it's, it's depending on the screen like two to three times the pixel density. And so actually when it renders out, it's like 1080 by 1920 and like the screen is massive. Um, and so like the point is, is when you take screenshots of these apps, what you want to do is like s get um, an extension called window resizer, uh, put it at like 1280 uh, in width and like 800 in height. And the reason is, is because uh, 1280 is typically the lowest screen size that most people have, the people who have smaller than that. But 1280 will account for, I think, 95% of the internet uh, for desktop users. And then uh, take a screenshot of that size, and then you put it into a frame in Figma that is exactly that size, and then you design there. And you learn all about their, their spacing strategies, like what are they doing, looking for like the space between elements. Make sure to use the developer tools uh, within Chrome or whatever you're using to like see the space in between elements because 
the text like has a box around it that's invisible that adds a couple extra pixels on either side. And so like you might think that the space between elements is one thing when it's actually another. So learning what that actually is. But yeah, basically like take screenshots of them and then recreate them. Like do your best to use them as a stencil and understand their spacing strategies. And like, why do they have it there? Like, are they using outlines? Are they using shadow? Can you recreate the shadow? And then like keep doing that over and over with your favorite websites. Do it, use every one of them as a stencil first and then do your best to recreate it without a stencil and do, do it without measuring each thing. Like what, what are their strategies? Like try and learn about it. Um, and that goes like uh, in hand in hand with the eight point grid system. Highly recommend you, you learn that which basically means that your spacing strategies, sizing strategies are all increments of eight with occasional um, uses of four and 12. Um, and so that means your icons, everything else are um, in, like in the spaces of eight and you know all that stuff. The uh, line height of text doesn't really apply to that. But honestly, if you just did this, if you just started practicing you know, doing UI based on other people's websites and products, you'll already improve your designs a lot. And then you start copying what they have um, this is why we actually have our students in kick -Ass UX. We have them pick existing companies with existing products, ideally, because they have to copy what's there and learn how to apply it to a company. Because like 99% of the time when you're hired as a UX designer, you're not creating something from scratch. You're adding to something that exists. So how can you show that you can hop into a company and do that? So that's the first part of that answer. I know this is long, a little longer winded. The second part of the answer is when it comes to process. So how do you make sure you don't sound like a junior? Um, the biggest issue with most junior designers is that they use the UX process like a checklist. It's like you do every single thing. There are no constraints. There's nothing um, that you do all the things. It's like, oh, I started out and I, I, um, I interviewed 20 people because I had the time and I you know, did a uh, card sort and I did all these other things. And it's like, that's not realistic. People don't do that. You don't have time for that. Like the ma majority of the time in a project, it's like, if I'm, I'm lucky to get user interviews in, like I try and validate as much as I possibly can. And I will almost always schedule time for usability testing. But a lot of times I don't get upfront research time. It's just, there's just not valid. I, I, I literally don't have a chance with the amount of things that I'm working on. And so what ended up happening is I do a ton of research upfront as much as I possibly can on my own. I look through forums, I try and get surveys if I can, I try and get interviews if I can, but a lot of times I can't. And so from there I hop into like ideating about the solution, I, I iterate a ton and then I come out with something that I then get feedback on from people and then I move on to the final design. But, but the point is, is like with process, most people are doing it like a checklist. They're not actually thinking through critically about the things they need to do. And like my favorite metaphor about this is like in UX, you wanna be like a Kung Fu master. So if you think about like the old movies of like the, the epic Kung Fu um, masters that are there, they only use the amount of movement necessary to land a blow or to get out of the way. That way they're not expending unnecessary energy. And the same thing applies in UX. You do not wanna do something just because, because that's wasteful. You only wanna take the action that is necessary at that moment. So if you have enough information to move forward, then you move forward. Like you don't need to be like, you know, spinning your wheels and trying to figure things out. If you understand generally what you're doing and you, and you know that that's the right way to go, then go that way. And this is where you have validation built in later on and you do your best to validate everything that you're putting out. But like, for example, like on most projects at this point in my career, I wouldn't recommend this upfront, but I don't do wireframes. And the reason I don't create wireframes is because they're not necessary for my process. I generally am using a, design system or I'm able to build something really quickly from scratch that is the high visual design and I add it to the, to, the, to the design library. But like, if you were to look at my process, it would never include wireframes with very few exceptions. That again, that's not means you should copy it, but I'm doing, I'm following a process that makes sense to me and like is using critical thinking to get there. And so like a big part of moving from junior to just a mid-level designer is building that design intuition to know what to do next. It's like, you start with a problem, you fully define the problem, and that will tell you what direction to go. You then follow that direction until you don't have enough information, you go learn more information, and then you keep following that, and eventually you end up at your destination by like slowly but surely making decisions that make sense in that moment, not by doing something idealistic and like doing every little thing one by one, like a checklist, because no one does that. Anyway, long-winded answer to answer both sides of that.
Well, that was great. Uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all of these uh, questions. Now, before we end the session today, are there any more questions in the audience? Anything else that you would like to ask? Um, any clarities so far? Everyone seems to be okay. All right. Well, then I think that was a very good use uh, of our time and of uh, your time, Colton. I really appreciate you taking the time for this and um, being with us today for this guest lecture and answering all the questions. It was an absolute pleasure having you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm like always <laughs> looking at the two different screens because I don't have a screen mirror here. Um, but yeah, it was wonderful having you. And uh, thank you very much and we'll chat soon. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day.